Horror films in 1975 brought us the directorial debut of David Cronenberg, some female androids, and one of the most iconic horror musicals ever. 1976 brings us the son of evil incarnate and the worst prom in the history of cinema. As we truck along with our year-by-year -year breakdown, we present to you the 10 best horror films of 1976. A horror movie that is named on just as many all-time worst lists as Citizen Kane is on all-time best list is either A, doing something seriously wrong, or B, doing something seriously right. The latter seems more appropriate. This film aims to disgust, revolt, and offend, and it probably does so better than just about any other movie you're likely to see. The film follows a mysterious stage performer who brings female actors to the stage and performs acts of vile mutilation and dismemberment before a somewhat disbelieving, horrified crowd. You could probably guess the twist. Yep, none of this is actually a show. It's all quite real. Oh, yeah. Many attempts have been made to dramatize the tale of Jack the Ripper, but Jess Franco's effort into the subject proves to be one of the best. Our killer is given a sense of duality and warped motivations that surpass those provided to him in other treatments. The film mainly concerns one Dr. Olaf, a trusted member of society and respected physician, who finds himself driven by his own lust and psychosis to brutally murder local harlots under the cover of night. As Orloff's bloody rampage continues, and word of his proclivities begin to spread in the papers and on the streets, the police realize they have a serial murderer on their hands, but seem virtually powerless to stop him. In a desperate effort to bait and capture our killer, the lead detective's girlfriend volunteers to pose as one of the streetwalkers and gets in way over her head. <gasps> Genie. Ah! NYPD Detective Lieutenant Nicholas investigates a series of murders committed by random New Yorkers who claim that God told them to. This film defies conventions with an amorphous script whose hooks are constantly being pierced into viewers. A fascinating story emerges out of this police procedure which eventually has our detective chasing down an enigmatic, androgynous messiah figure. Despite the obviously otherworldly angle, the film feels like a rather grounded and unnerving look at religious fanaticism. The vacancy the followers embody is nearly pod-like, as if they've been possessed. But by what? In many ways, the first half of God Told Me To feels like a stripped-down apocalypse story. Yes, the narrative starts to get progressively nuttier. Virgin births, alien vaginas, but there's a Things Falls Down Apart vibe in this film's sense of random violence that's genuinely unsettling. A fear of being snuffed out simply because. You promise you won't tell anybody else? I can't, I can't promise that. It's my job to find out. Well, I'll tell you anyway. God told me to. A young restorer is commissioned to save a controversial mural located in the church of a small, isolated village. As you can probably guess, strange things begin to occur. Despite often being championed as one of the great Jallos, the house with laughing windows doesn't offer much in the way of traditional Jallo ichiography. What it lacks in readily identifiable motifs, however, it makes up for a near suffocating overabundance of atmosphere. And what's more, while the film is certainly a gripping murder mystery, it is also an intelligent allegory, set pointingly in the early 50s, of a post-war Italy struggles to emerge from the fascist outrages of its recent past. After all, great art has always had the power to reveal uncomfortable truths. A family moves into a large old mansion in the countryside, which seems to have a mysterious and sinister power over its new residents. Given the relative subtlety of its storytelling, burnt offerings won't be to every horror fan's taste. But rest assured, there are some genuinely spine-tingling bits here, including the shock conclusion and several instances in which our main character is haunted by the sight of a ghostly hearse from his past, driven by perhaps the most terrifying chauffeur in movie history. The sight of his grinning face will make the blood boil of even the most hardened horror buff run ice cold. The 
Set in a small town on the Texas-Arkansas border in the 1940s, the town of dreaded sundown is something of an oddity. In addition to being presented in a pseudo-documentary format interspersed with newsreel-style narration, the film also sets itself apart from its peers of the period with some ill-judged attempts at humor. The comic relief presented here only dissipates any tension built up in previous scenes. The film's good points, though, far outweigh its flaws, and the best thing about it is the actual man who made the town dread sundown. A silent psycho who specializes in attacking young couples late at night, his face always covered in a burlap sack, with holes crudely cut so only fleeting glimpses of his eyes are ever visible. Birthed at the beginning of a genre boom known for churning out derivative mass killer movies, it's actually remarkable that the town of dreaded sundown is as unique as it is. It's a chaotic blend of slapstick, slaughter, police procedural, and true crime melodrama. There really isn't another film quite like Sundown, and that's saying something in this genre. An Englishman and his pregnant wife decide to go on holiday before their baby is born so he heads to an exotic Spanish island that they soon find is fairly deserted. In fact, the only inhabitants they do come across are kids, no older than their early teens. The kids do fun, cute little things such as beating old men to death, using corpses as piñatas, and hassling dead bodies. It should be said that this movie works very well at making these seemingly innocent youngsters incredibly menacing and to a degree genuinely frightening. The cinematography in the film is near perfect, using the secluded and deserted nature of the surroundings to engulf the characters, and the faraway shots of the children amassing in the village streets to create dread. The filmmakers pick children who are at once cute and terrifying, as we know what lurks behind their smiling faces. Having the protagonists be parents themselves was also a genius move, as the horror that adores their faces goes much deeper than simply fearing for their lives. It's generally a bit of a taboo in the film to combine children with murder. Usually that means filmmakers are wary of killing a kid in a movie. That's crossing the line. But it also works the other way too. Alice Sweet Alice isn't scared of such taboos. Not only does it include a child being killed mere minutes into its runtime, its entire plot also revolves around the notion that another child may be the one doing the killing. The child in question is a titular Alice, a badly behaved 12 year old girl who constantly bullies her younger sister. With her parents divorced and her dad out of town, it's perhaps understandable that Alice isn't getting along with her sister or her mother. It's not long, however, before things go seriously out of control. And the fun begins. <laughs> Mysterious deaths surround an American ambassador. Could the child, Damien, that he is raising actually be the Antichrist? The devil's own son? Everything in the omen falls into place with ease. The cold setting and sense of gloom almost oozes out of your television screen. Director Richard Donner filmed the movie utilizing the creepiest possible angles and techniques. At no time is there a visually lacking frame in this movie. Throw in big scares like the unforgettable nanny that hangs herself at Damien's birthday party. And we have one for the ages. Worst birthday party ever. Then there's a tricycle scene that will literally make you cringe as it unfolds. It's entertaining and yes, still ominous after all these years. A landmark of satanic cinema. Over the years, it seems Carrie's official reputation has crumbled away to that of a cheap, exploitative, derivative teen schlocker. Which is sad, and not deserved. This is a movie that rewards careful viewing. By paying close attention to performance, narrative structure, and dramatic use of montage, subtle layered depths and complexities of perspective emerge. A perfect mix of pop parody, visual disgust, and sizzling social satire, 
The movie plays the audience like a cheap fiddle, setting it up and knocking it down with tactical precision. Working it over at such a deep level of sensation, viewers may find themselves thoroughly immersed in the story's emotional stakes, despite the silliness of the subject. And the shock of that bloody hand coming out of the ground to grab our survivor leaves the audience with something disturbing to maul over afterwards. Once again, thanks for watching, and don't forget to let us know your favorite movie of the year in the comment section below.